Welcome to everyone um, to this year's UC virtual um, open evening for architecture planning and environmental policy. You're all very, very welcome. My name is Laura Egan O'Brien and I'm the marketing manager for the College of Engineering and Architecture here in UC. And I'm going to be your host for this evening and I'm going to introduce our speakers and bring you along this journey with us and moderate the panel discussion. Um, so I'm delighted that so many of you could join us. I know that most of our attendees that registered are from Ireland. Um, so really great welcome to you. And I know a lot of you probably are preparing for your mock, so we appreciate you taking the time to join us. And then I also know that a lot of, um, uh, we have potential international students joining us as well. And I know the time, Irish time isn't suiting everyone. So we appreciate you also making the effort to join us. So big, big welcome to everyone. And I hope it'll make for a really great panel discussion, really great Q and A session. And we hope that you learn a lot from the event this evening. Um, so I know before this particular webinar, many of you may have had a chance to join some of our other events that we've held this year, um, particularly the, the UCD Virtual Open Day in November. So for this particular event, we're not focusing on subject specific information um, that's very, you know, you know, very specific to the programs um, itself or entry requirements and things like that. We really, really want to showcase the student experience and what it's actually like to study um, with one of our courses here in UCD, particularly obviously architecture, landscape architecture, and then city planning and environmental policy. Um, but not to worry if you did miss any of those particular events that we might have held, or maybe you did miss a, a school presentation um, or school talk, and you want that more sp course specific information, the sessions from the open day in November were recorded and they were filmed and recorded by um, some of our academics within the School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy. And I might get my colleague Katie, who's joining us, I'm going to monitor the chat and put up any relevant links to put a link to our YouTube channel, which is UCD Eng Arc, where you'll find those specific um, recordings from the open day in November that you can look back at and find more information and also Katie might all, uh, put up in the chat um, my email address and her email address so if any you want clarified that we covered this evening or something that we don't we don't get to cover and you want more information on please reach out to us after the event as well. Um, so if you do want to join in the discussion and you want to ask us some questions, there's a Q&A button located at the control panel at the bottom of your screen. Please type your questions in there and we'll get through as many as we can this evening. Um, and as I said, if we if we don't get through them all, um, our email addresses, email addresses are there for you to follow up with us afterwards as well. But we will try and make through as many as we can. Um, so before we get started, I'm just going to show a very, very short video. Um, it's called UCD Rising to the Future. Um, UCD as Ireland's you know, largest university, uh, we're well placed to help you um, to find inspiration on your journey and um, to discover what you want to do in the future. So this um, will kind of give you an insight into what UCD city has to offer. Every journey finds its own inspiration. In deep conversations and idle chat. In debate, discussion, and dialogue. In ideas that start small, but go on to change the world. UCD is where those journeys begin. A catalyst and canvas for inquiring minds, sharpening ambition, sparking the intellect, shaping each and every one of us to rise to the future, to leave our mark on the world. In science and the arts, in tech, business, and the environment, the world is waiting for you to take that first step. Find your degree at ucd.ie forward slash CAO. UCD, rising to the future. Okay, so it's a very, very short clip. It just kind of highlights that UCD is a place where students can sharpen their ambition, uh, spark their intellect, and rise to the future to meet the challenges that are coming your way. Um, so hopefully that means uh, you know, you're really interested in UCD and then we're going to try and entice you to do one of our programs within the School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy. So in order not to delay the proceedings any longer, I'm going to pass you over to Professor Owen O'Neill, who is our head of school for the School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy. And he's going to give you a little bit of a run through of the school itself and a, a very quick overview of the three programs that we have to offer within this particular school. So Owen, if you want to take it over. Thanks very much, Laura. Uh, so very nice to meet you all virtually. My name is Owen O'Neill and I'm head of the School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy here in UCD. Um, so just to give me a little bit of background, I'm going to share um, some slides very briefly um, about the school. So it's one of the, 
the school is located in the College of Engineering and Architecture. There's a number of colleges. We're one of the, we're the largest school by students and by staff number in the college. Um, and the school brings together four related disciplines to provide a unique learning environment, architecture, landscape architecture, regional urban planning, environmental policy, architecture. The program has been around for over 100 years, regional urban planning over 50 years and landscape architecture and environmental policy offer relatively well uniquely um, provide programs on in Ireland. Uh, landscape is the only landscape architecture program. Um, in Ireland, environmental policy was one of the first established environmental economic research units um, in the country. Um, so it's a re very research active body of staff in terms of the faculty. There's about 50 faculty. Um, of those, we've seven new staff have, have arrived or have arrived since COVID um, started. So we've a lot of new staff over the last couple of years. That includes Nadreen Saraji, who's professor of architectural design. She arrived to us from Hong Kong University. So we have a lot of new staff and there's a, we're recruiting another three over the next couple of months as well. So there's a, a lots of new ideas, um, new research um, programs coming into the school through those new staff. Uh, we've also got about 40 design fellows. These are um, practitioner teachers who inform what we call studio. So I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about the individual programs in a minute. So we've between the, the faculty and design fellows, there's about 80 to 90 people who are involved in teaching each year across the programmes in the school. Um, the faculty, there's two types of faculty in the school, those who are very, very research active and they'd be bringing in European funding, national level uh, funding to inform, to, to bring about new research that informs the teaching and is embedded in the teaching programmes. And then those who are much more oriented towards design and design research. And a lot of our faculty in architecture and landscape architecture own their own practices or work in practices and bring that expertise back into the programme because all the programmes are accredited and are very career oriented. Um, so three programmes, landscape architecture, four year degree, city planning and environment policy, it's a three year degree, but we have a number of um, follow on very relevant degrees, uh, urban design, um, environmental policy um, and the Masters in Regional Urban Planning, which is when you do the combination, you, you basically get full accreditation, you have partial accreditation doing the theory. And then architecture, which is really treated as a as a five year program, a four plus one. So your degree and then a and then a master's program. Many students actually undertake it more like as a uh, a six year program, perhaps because uh, a lot of students during their during their degree program take a year out to work and practice and gain experience uh, before they before they finalize or before they finish up their degree uh, experience. Um, so I mentioned accreditation. Uh, our, our programs are variously accredited. I'll just mention some of the accrediting bodies, the Royal Institute of British Architects, the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland, the Royal Town Planning Institute, the Irish Planning Institute, the Irish Landscape Institute. So all these bodies accredit our programs. So it means you can work out as, or you can, you're on a pathway to a chartership in the in the relevant um, subject area um, for that particular profession. Um, in terms of the specific types of program, the experience you might get, um, generally the intakes vary between about 30 in 30 to 40 in city planning, environmental policy, or landscape architecture, and then maybe seven, 60 to 70 in architecture. So the combinations typically of uh, traditional lectures, whether they're some of them are smaller scale lectures but just with, within the class domain, or others are larger lectures shared across a wider uh, portfolio of programs in the university. So you might have quite a large class potentially. Um, all our programs have what are called studio classes. So in landscape architecture and architecture it could be up to 50% of the program. City planning and environmental policy, it's about 30%, maybe 35% of the program. These are what might, be called project based classes or group work classes um, in city planning, environment policy and landscape architecture. Architecture, they tend to be more design oriented, potentially about individual developing individual portfolios and projects and sometimes uh, group activities as well. Um, there are strong opportunities to undertake Erasmus. Architecture in particular has the, has the largest body of students that undertake a year abroad through Erasmus. Um, despite COVID, students have still been still been able to undertake those opportunities, um, and, and hopefully it'll, it'll sort of grow again to the previous numbers. Uh, we also generally have a lot of international students across our programs, 
um, and usually exchange students that come in for a semester or for a year um, as well. Um, what I also mentioned that the programs are, are very career oriented. So for example, landscape architecture does an internship placement opportunity for those students. City planning and environmental policy, as I mentioned, there's a pathway to a professional accreditation and architecture. Um, there's a strong emphasis on, on, on getting those getting those experiences. And that the body of staff generally have a large uh, practice based experience that is brought back into the classrooms, particularly the student oriented um, classrooms. So the programs are taught in the Richview Newstead buildings on the campus. It's sort of like an enclave at the edge of the campus. Richview in particular is sort of a unique um, mini campus of its own. Um, so design studios are at the heart of the programs, as I mentioned. There's a well-equipped workshop and building lab, uh, particularly yeah, heavily used by the architecture program. Exhibition spaces. Um, landscape architecture would have quite a quite a lot of exhibitions, as does architecture. So computer facilities dedicated in, within the school, um, and then the best architecture and planning library in the country that's located in Richview. So it's a unique library dedicated to Richview that the students all have full access to. Um, in terms of the programs, generally, I'll just go back to the programs. What I, what I would say is the contemporary challenges that you might consider, whether that's climate change. Um, or even in terms of COVID, changing the way people or where people work that may persist into the future. Challenges associated with housing, with the urban realm, land use change, uh, rural development, all these are addressed in our programmes. Um, I would say climate change is increasingly being embedded across the programmes. Um, and especially in terms of the new staff we've brought in, increasingly a lot of those have climate expertise um, and they're the research that they undertake uh, is at the cutting edge. So, for example, some of the research has been cited in the uh, report of the inter the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Climate Change, the IPCC report. So, a lot of the the research that is being done is at the cutting edge and is really informing policy and practice um, in Ireland and internationally. So that just gives you a fla a very very brief flavour of the types of content but more, more particularly in terms of the teaching format. So it's a combination of traditional lectures, but heavy emphasis on studio. And that probably distinguishes our programs to any of the other programs in the university, is the emphasis on studio project work that you undertake individually, depending on the program that you're, that you're um, registered to. So I'll hand you back to Laura. Hopefully that gives a little flavor of the experience you might have uh, in the school. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Owen. Um, yeah, just a very quick overview of the programs and kind of what the school itself has to offer um, and that the programs are, you know, really career focused and um, nice small class sizes. Uh, a lot of the research that is going on in school informs the teaching that happens as well. So uh, thank you, Owen, for that really great um, introduction to the programs. So now we're going to launch into our panel discussion with our students. So I'm going to ask our three students to turn their cameras on um, and their sound on, and we'll get started with some of the questions that we have um, kind of prepared. Um, and hopefully that most of the questions will kind of cover some of the, the questions that our attendees came to the event looking to get answered for today. Um, so we have Ruth, who is a third year student within our architectural program. We also have Laureen, who is just finishing up her master's in landscape architecture, having done the undergrad in landscape architecture with us as well. And then we have Ev Evan, who's in third and final year in his city planning and environmental policy degree. So thank you all very, very much for joining us. Um, so I'm going to launch into, you know, the typical question that people want to know uh, specifically from our students is why you chose to do your particular program and then maybe why UCD was a draw for that particular program as well. Uh, Lorena, I know you didn't really have a lot of choice. Uh, Landscape Architecture is only offered in UCD, but you might have some insights into there as well. So, um, Evan, we might start with you if that's OK. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's not a bother. Um, I suppose I'll answer the two separately. I'll firstly answer why I chose CPEP, um, and then secondly, I'll answer why I chose to do it at UCD. Um, so, well, firstly, I thought that um, CPEP was an interesting choice, and I kind of had like a very wide variety of interests in what I like kind of wanted to study, um, and had researched a wide variety of courses, but I felt that no other courses really kind of matched um, CPEP and kind of combined all my interests into the one course. 
um, which is why I ultimately ended up choosing this course. Um, and I'm very happy that I did, as I'm really, really enjoying the course. As for why I chose to study in UCD, um, well, I chose it for a number of reasons. Um, for, firstly, the facilities are absolutely um, next to none. We have amazing facilities. Um, so just to give you a quick breakdown, we have a world-class swimming pool, multiple gyms, a hockey pitch, five-a-side football pitches, several AstroTurf pitches, and numerous grass pitches as well, and a soon-to-be running track, um, all of which I can avail of um, completely free of charge as a student. Um, secondly, the staff are incredibly friendly, efficient and helpful, um, and they're very responsive and really, really friendly and easy to deal with um, and are, always answer your emails. Um, and then additionally, class size was a big thing for me because I kind of came from a very kind of small school. Um, so I only had, you know, between 15 and 20 people in my class. Um, so by having 32 and 20, you know, in my whole year, that really helped me settle in really fast. Um, so that was another reason. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Evan. I think that'll be um, a comfort to some students who are looking in at UC being a very large university, maybe possibly intimidating coming from second level um, education to know that the class sizes are small and that you didn't feel um, it was it was that I mean that that was a good thing. Um, so thank you for sharing your um, your reasons for coming to us. Uh, Ruth, I might go to you next on why you chose architecture. Um, so I kind of chose architecture because well, I knew I wanted to do some sort of construction based um degree and I'd also done engineering and construction and DCG and I enjoyed maths in secondary school so it kind of just led to to that and also in transition year I'd done experience in architecture firm so I really enjoyed that so that's why I chose architecture um and the reason I chose UCD is because it had the most accreditations um also you didn't have a portfolio or interview to, do to get into architecture unlike DIT and UL I think it is um, so it was just a lot less hassle to be stressed about before you're leaving cert. And um, yeah, I guess the facilities as well, like my sister had came to UCD as well, and she'd always spoke about societies and get involved. Um, so yeah, I'm actually part of the Architecture Society as well, and I really enjoy that. Brilliant. So UCD, from your point of view, has a lot to offer as far as the architecture course goes, which is great. Um, and Noreen, uh, last but not least, you, yourself and why you chose landscape architecture. Hi, Laura. Um, well, looking at the campus photograph behind you, um, I think what she said about the small numbers in the classes is very relevant because it looks a bit daunting. It's a beautiful photograph, but um, really rich view for, for architecture and for planning and uh, Newstead for landscape architecture. They're amazing facilities and there's a very kind of warm community between those two buildings, sharing uh, the labs and the engineering and the workshop facilities and the library, um, which is a beautiful library, as Owen said earlier. I am very interested in climate, the climate crisis, biodiversity and habitat loss. And I really felt that landscape architecture would help me to develop my knowledge in those areas and hopefully to make a little bit of a difference. So my master's that I've gone on to study is very focused in those areas. Um, there's a great sense of camaraderie with studio. You really get to know each other, all age groups mixing, um, easy access to lots of facilities as my other two students have said on the campus. So I Thanks, Lorraine. Uh, yeah, I think the sense of community that you get within a, a, these particular programs, because you have that kind of um, slightly separated away from the main campus and the small class size, I think, yeah, the, the sense of community with these programs is, is really strong. And you get a sense of that when you talk to students who talk about, you know, the social aspect to it, the friends they make and things like that. So I think that's good for people tuning in to know. Um, so another um, kind of questions that we get asked, particularly for architecture, but I think it's important for landscape and city planning and environment policy as well is, you know, it is quite an intensive course. Um, what is a typical week or a typical day like for you? Do you have much free time or are you spending all the time in the classroom or the studio? Uh, Ruth, I might go to you first. Uh, yeah, so, well, our typical week is about like nine to six, but that's with a few breaks in, uh, Monday to Wednesday. And then you have Thursday off for doing studio work. And then Friday, you usually have your review. But even though you're in that much, it actually doesn't feel that much because you're really close with your course, with people in your course, and you're working with them and talking to them constantly. So it doesn't actually feel as you're doing that much. Um, with the workload, 
you kind of get used to it after the first semester like you don't realize how much work you're actually doing but you're getting it done and you eventually like make time to go out and do stuff or go out and it's kind of killing at first but you, like it's fine after a month or two you'll get into the swing of things great so it kind of co comes down to personal time management but you didn't feel like you were spending the whole time in the classroom or the studio that you had you had a bit of time to yourself and you had uh, you know a good structure to the course that way yeah definitely Perfect. So, uh, Lorraine, I might go to you next if you want to talk about maybe what a typical life for a landscape architecture student is. So, again, it's quite similar to architecture because while I was in doing landscape architecture, I had a son doing architecture. And uh, so we shared a lot of knowledge. But the the camaraderie with your classmates in studio as you're working away, it's almost like a home from home. Um, it's quite relaxed. And then when the pressure comes on, you have each other as support and you share ideas and that really helps. Um, it's probably been a little bit different for people with COVID lockdowns and different things going on, but really you look forward to going into studio and the sharing of knowledge, ideas and friendships. So yes, Brilliant. home from home. <laughs> Great, so that peer-to-peer -peer learning is a very important aspect of the course as well. Yeah. Great, and then Evan, um, your course is maybe slightly different than the very studio focused landscape architecture and architecture, but what's your typical week or day like? Um, yeah, it's it's definitely not as intensive as um, architecture or landscape architecture. So typically per week, we'd have between kind of, you know, 10 and 15 hours of lectures, which, you know, to some it may seem like it's not a lot. Um, but it's important to emphasize that, like, a lot of work is expected of you outside the classroom. It's not just what you're learning inside the classroom. And while you might not have studio based sessions, um, there is a lot of kind of like assignment work and kind of reading up on things. Um, to you know further your learning and similar to the other two um, speakers there is also a lot of kind of teamwork and group work um, involved in the degree as well and you're very often working in teams and there's been many many late nights spent in um, libraries and things like that um, finishing up group projects and stuff um, so you form a really really close connection um, to your fellow, fellow peers as well. Brilliant and um, Evan I'll stick with you if you don't mind but how was your transition from kind of the leaving search or second level education into university? Was there anything that surprised you when you came to UCD? Um, well, at first, it's obviously a kind of a very daunting experience. Um, and I definitely recognize the fact that it's a big change at first. Um, but between the lecturers and, you know, the sports staff and all the ad admin, they really helped me settle in kind of really, really quickly. And the lecturers provide you with all the information that you need in terms of like referencing and um, you know essay writing and how to like properly reference and properly like write in an academic sense um, which I wasn't even aware of before I even kind of came into college um, and they kind of uh, yeah they teach you lots of different things um, and they help you settle in really fast. Great so it sounds like there's lots of supports there available for students during that um, kind of transition period which is great. Uh, Ruth um, did you find anything surprising when you came from second level to third level? um yeah I was just gonna say about the supports as well like there's the whole writing sports and maths and the uh, James Joyce found them very helpful because like it is a big transition to have to start doing like references and stuff which you never done in secondary school and uh, I found them very good brilliant and then and um, Lorraine you came in as a mature student did you find that that was an additional level of complexity to starting university Yes, that was really interesting for me because not having grown up with the kind of technology we use now, that was a big challenge. And um, I must say that the younger students in class were really good. We had a lot of group work in the beginning and I, I learned so much from them. Um, and I also wanted to mention, so I'm dyslexic and the access department, which is based uh, beside the Joyce Library, um, is an excellent facility. So nobody needs to be worried about things like that. There's lots of support in UCD. And when my fellow students were talking there, I was just thinking, you also get an opportunity to work with the other disciplines. So in landscape architecture, we did modules with the architects and we did projects with the architects and project with projects with the planners. So there's a lot of communication because they're all interlinked as subjects. Brilliant. Yeah. And I think your, your point about the access centre is really good for students who, you know, there's lots of supports there for students who may be coming in through the, the DARE scheme or the HEAR scheme 
or we have the UCD Global um, team who are there for international students to help you settle in. Um, but yeah, there's lots of supports available in UCD. Um, and I think, yeah, not to be worried, we have a number of mature students who are looking at architecture, landscape architecture and planning and to not be daunted, not to be put off that you will not be alone. And there's plenty of supports there for, for students who are making that transition. Um, so thank you, Lorraine, uh, for sharing your experience there. Um, Ruth, I might go to you for some maybe specific architecture questions that I know we get an awful lot of the time is, do you actually have to be good at art? Do you have to be good at drawing? Are they subjects you need to be doing for the Leaving Cert? and were you at a disadvantage for not having to do a portfolio and show your skills before coming into the course? Uh, well, you're definitely not at a dis disadvantage for not having a portfolio because like everyone has different things which they think would represent what their idea of architecture is. But like when you get into the course, um, whether you do DCG or art or anything, the first year is based solely on bringing everyone up to the same skills level. And I, I say I done DCG in construction, so I was used to more like technical hard line drawings. Um, but I struggled a lot with like sketching and just being really kind of creative as well. I was so used to just looking at a drawing and just doing what I was told. Um, so technology in first year really teaches you the skills about how to kind of be more carefree kind of what you're taught and uh, to not be afraid to just like try even sketching even if it's awful and also the mechanical drawings like I know there's a lot of people in my course who done art for uh, second in secondary school and they struggled with mechanical drawings at first but after a while they kind of realized it was pretty straightforward and uh, you honestly couldn't tell the difference between who had done art and who had done DCG or construction after second year. Great. So it's not something that our attendees have to worry about that, you know, they'll teach you all the necessary skills when you get into the course itself and that it's not a very maths or engineering focused course. It's very much focused on the creative aspect and trying to teach you that, as you said, to be more free with your yeah. with your thoughts. Yeah, like, of course, it's helpful if you have done DCG or art, but like if you haven't chosen the subjects, I wouldn't worry too much about it either. Perfect. Thanks, Ruth. Um, Green, I'll go to you next. And maybe just for students who may be thinking about they have that creative drive, they want to maybe do architecture, but they're kind of interested in, as you were talking about, you know, climate change, diversity, and kind of more of that landscape side. What sets landscape architecture apart from architecture and maybe why someone should consider that over architecture? Well, I suppose the whole um, relationship to what's outside of the building. Um, you know, when you're when you're standing on the ground looking at the soil, uh, Michael Hurick, who who was very involved in the course, he would have brought us in a lot of site visits, and he would say, in first year, you're never going to look at what's around you in the same way again. Look up, look down, think about what's underneath your feet, look around you, look at the vistas, the views in and out, and so landscape architecture and architecture fit very well together you know I think that if you have an understanding of your surroundings around you you can then visualize what it's like to be inside a space looking out or outside a space looking in and I think that they work well together I think they should work more together because the building is set in the landscape there is um, a very famous architect, I'm trying to think of his name now, and he goes to look at the landscape first before he designs the building. And he he would feel, and all his buildings are different because that's the way he pro approaches his architecture. And he looks at what the people need as well when he's designing his buildings. So, and again, with our ar landscape architecture, you don't need to be great at drawing or art. You can learn as you go along and, it's practice, you know, it's like anything. The more you look and see and practice, the better you get. There's a great thing in the library in, uh, in Richview. It's called a light box. And often you'll see first year students in there tracing over something to learn how to draw again and how to think about perspective. But there's, there are great supports in architecture and landscape architecture from the staff to do with art. Brilliant, yeah, I think, and I think landscape architecture is becoming such a more integral part of 
you know, the whole built environment um, in Ireland, but also internationally and around the world. So I think it's a great um, area to be getting into to now. And because we're the only university that offers it, you know, the amount of graduates who are coming out with landscape architecture is still a relatively small base. So and, you could, and you can really see that too, Laura, with COVID. And if you look around your environment now and the way we're adapting our outdoor space to suit our needs, you know, outside of the building, the spaces we use, very, very important. Green space, so important. Trees, you know, carbon sequestration. You learn so much in landscape architecture about the country we live in and how we can make it a better place uh, for all living creatures. Brilliant. So, sounds great. I hope sign me up. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then Evan, I might go to you then just to touch on obviously city planning and environmental policy is maybe not as clear to students what you actually do as part of the course at say architecture or landscape architecture. What are some of the subjects that you actually cover as part of your city planning and environmental policy degree? Um, yeah, so it's definitely not as clear cut as um, architecture or landscape architecture. Um, but just to kind of give you a quick breakdown as to kind of the subjects that you cover. Um, so like in the first year, um, the modules are definitely a bit more generic and they kind of give you an introduction to all the different elements that there is to obviously the planning element of things and then also kind of the environmental aspect of things. Um, so you kind of have an introduction to like spatial planning and then you have like a history to city planning. Um, so starting to understand you know, why outdoor spaces are structured the way they are, things that we've learned from the past that we need to improve into the future. As Lorraine was just saying, how we integrate, you know, greenery and trees and all that stuff into the urban built environment, not only as kind of like a, you know, reactionary thing, but, you know, it's there for a purpose. It's there from the get-go rather than, oh, you know, we have to fill this space with something. Um, with regards to the environmental side of things, you cover everything from kind of environmental policy um, to real life kind of case studies in first year as well, um, which give you a real like thorough understanding. And um, before you go forward into the second and third year modules, which are definitely a bit more specific and they kind of hone in on sort of niche aspects. Um, and as has been previously said, um, they equip you with various different skills that employers look favor favorably upon. Um, so, for example, we do a module called GIS, um, which is Geographical Information Systems, um, and employers look very favorably on that, um, as not a lot of people um, are able to use it. Um, it's about kind of like mapping data sets and all different things through computer software, um, it's, and it's something that's really, really useful in the field of planning. Um, you also learn about um, methods and policy kind of surrounding community involvement um, in the planning process, which is um, vitally important. Um, and then you also kind of gain a comprehensive understanding of planning and environmental elements um, from a policy perspective and real world perspective, as I've already mentioned. Um, you can't really hone in on like, you know, you can't really focus on the planning side per se, or you can't focus on, you know, the environmental side per se from an undergraduate perspective. Um, but once you kind of go through to your postgraduate into your master's, we offer three different masters, um, one in regional and urban planning, one in urban design, and then one in environmental policy, um, whereby you can actually focus in on a spe specific element that you may be interested in. Brilliant. So, I mean, it sounds like a really career focused um, degree, very um, much learning transferable skills that will work in a lot of different areas and very much based in kind of reality and, and what's topical at the moment as far as climate change and urbanism and all those kind of really topical areas that are going to have a massive impact into the future. So really exciting degree, I think, to be getting into to now as well. So thank you for sharing that, Evan. It's, it's really great. Um, maybe we'll touch on a little bit about, obviously, these are very hands-on, very career-driven, practical degrees. Um, Ruth, if you might maybe tell us about a, a different a project that you've worked on that you've been particularly proud of within architecture, or maybe some of your favourite subjects or aspects of the course. Um, so in the second semester, actually, we got to uh, go to Tullamore to visit an old board pneumonia site um, that was really interesting and we actually had to build our project on the bog um, I don't know that might sound very exciting but uh, it was actually very good because it was a completely different scenery we used, were used to well most of them were used to and um, most of our projects are based in the city for now so uh, that was good to kind of get out of it and try a new landscape and we were completely there was no 
uh, ties on uh, materials we had to use or and there was no constraints at all like we were free to do whatever we want so basically that was very good um i do enjoy the engineering and the technology subjects because they're slightly more maths based um but a lot of the students uh find them difficult at first if they haven't done construction um but uh yeah that's really it. i kind of enjoy them because we got to use the building lab a lot when we during the modules um so it's a bit more practical i guess than sitting and listening to kind of history or um in kind of about different practices and stuff like that sure uh, that's great. And Lorraine, um, is there a particular project or um, practical aspect of the course that you found particularly interesting you'd like to share? Well, I suppose for my thesis, yeah, I loved so many things about the course. So I was very interested in archaeology and, you know, how how areas develop, why we settle in places and, you know, why they draw us to them. So I did my thesis for my degree on Bruna Boigne, the Bend of the Boyne. And I looked at the old canal system that happened in the early industrial revolution up there, where the river, uh, when the tide dropped, they needed a part canal system to navigate uh, transport from Navan down to uh, Drogheda and back up the river again. And as I explored it, I was learning about the nature up there. And I was also learning about the old lock keepers houses and how, how they've fallen into disrepair how the old towpaths can be used. They are part used for walking. And so looking at all of that, and it was a great project to do. And it led me down the path of more investigation on the environmental end of things. So yes. Great. So I, I mean, I think it's good for students to know that, you know, projects can have real meaning that they can lead you down to maybe what you actually ultimately want to do in the future or, you know, different areas and aspects of a course that you, that you enjoy um, and really kind of, gives you that satisfaction of being able to see something through, which is great. Um, Evan, do you have a particular project or subject that you'd like to share a bit more about to our attendees? Um, yeah, um, it was probably a project that I worked on last year that I enjoyed the most. Um, I kind of did a case study on rat mines. And now that may not sound very exciting to people, um, but it gave me a real breakdown. Like you had to do kind of a proper deep thorough analysis as you would be if you're kind of applying for like planning permission. Um, and then you had to design and sculpt kind of your own, um, you know, infill site. So you had to plan a settlement or you had to design this or you had to design that. And it kind of taught me a lot about the planning process. Um, and I definitely ruled out a number of things from actually doing the project that I definitely know that I wouldn't like in the future, such as like sifting through like um, some of the, you know, detailed plans and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it taught me a lot and I know where I want to go for now. Brilliant. Um, and then Ruth, I might just go back to you just around, obviously architecture is so heavily studio focused. Um, could you tell our attendees maybe what actually happens in the studio? How does that work? Um, you know, what, do you get project briefs or do you have a lot of like ownership of, of the work you're doing and um, do you get help from staff and things like that in the studio uh yeah so like studio is basically just like a desk you have in a studio i guess but it's completely your own workspace um there's in first year anyways you'll have two modules kind of based on studio which would be architectural design and technology and the for about uh i think it's 12 or 10 hours um during the week you have it for architectural design where the tutors will be in and uh, they might be with you this whole time they want to be speaking to other students and everything but they'll be there kind of like supervising you and if you want to ask questions or need help with anything or uh sometimes you have studio meetings with them uh, they'll talk to you and then for technology i think it's uh three or four hours a week we have it in studio where the same thing will be with tutors and they'll talk you through stuff or for technology as well they bring us into the building lab a lot um or demonstrate stuff in the studio um but yeah it's basically just having your own space to work on your own projects like of course you don't have to use the studio if you don't want to but a lot of students do because um the studio is open from uh, eight to nine every day um sorry monday to friday and you're completely away from home like you can leave it if you're sick of it like you don't have to bring anything home with you so it's a nice space just to have just to do your work and then kind of leave it behind and move on which I think is good for like 
separating your work and then your personal life. Yeah, I think that's I think that's great that there's a dedicated kind of space for for students to to have their inspiration and work on projects and as you said, um, leave them there and and kind of come back to them in at their own time, which is great. Um, Ruth, just to stick with you, just real quickly, um, obviously the structure of the architecture program um allows for an optional year out. Um, and some of our students or attendees might not know what that actually means. What happens during that year and is it compulsory or is it optional? Uh, yeah, it's completely optional. A lot of students do it because um, like you're to finish the course completely and do the master's is five years. So it's a long time to be kind of studying and especially for some students who may not have worked, say, on a construction site or even done internships with an architectural firm or anything they're learning all this information, they actually have no idea like where it's coming from or why they actually need it. Um, so a lot of students take a year out and either work in a firm, work in a construction company, anything at all, or even just to travel like, because they recommend that we do travel a lot and you know just see different construction practices and everything. Um, so yeah, I'm debating it now, but a lot of students, uh, so I'm in third year now and a lot of students after third year either do it or fourth year before the mass uh, if they do a one year masters um but yeah it's highly recommended among the tutors anyways for students who have never experienced like an architectural practice or construction company or anything like that yeah i think it's an important aspect of the course and something that's it's good to have there because as you said you can put what you learn in the classroom into practice because you may not actually you know had the wherewithal to think you know what ultimately it means in the end what you will do as as a day-to-day -day if you're going to work in architectural practice so that's that's really good and um, expanding on the whole kind of travel aspect of it obviously UCD has is is classified as Ireland's global university because we have a lot of connections with other universities around the world which are students available for either study abroad or Erasmus exchange opportunities um, and that's available for all the courses here. Um, Evan, you obviously didn't do it yourself, but you, you've experienced a couple of your friends going on study abroad. If you wanted to tell maybe some of our attendees a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, no, I, I personally didn't choose it myself um, because I'm looking at kind of a few master's options abroad. Um, but in terms of the CPEP program specifically, um, because it's a three-year program, the study abroad option offer or would extend the program to four years. Um, and there's a number of kind of like exchange universities. Um, one of my best friends is actually doing it in France currently in Tours. Um, so she's in France for the year and she's loving every minute of it. And it, you know, all the staff help you kind of apply for it and get like set up in terms of accommodation and getting all the like correct modules in sync and various different bits and bobs like that. Um, it's all processed through UCD and it's a really kind of painless process. Um, and it's definitely a really good option to look at, especially if you're, um, you know, looking at a course um, that you want to kind of do a year abroad in. Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, and I think it's, it's really great just to experience another culture or another way of learning or broaden your horizons. And employers quite like to see that kind of thing as well. So, yeah, it's a good opportunity. As I said, it's optional. Not everyone has to do it. But if you want to, that option is available to students, particularly um, with the, the, you know, it's called an international year for city planning and environmental policy. Um, so I think we have a time for a couple of more posed questions before we get into the Q&As that, that our attendees are asking. Um, so, um, Evan, you're in final year and Lorraine, you're kind of nearly finishing up and Ruth, you're seeing if you're going to take your year out. Um, so career-wise, obviously these degrees are very career orientated. Um, what are the careers like in your various fields or what are you hoping to do next? Um, Lorraine, maybe if I go to you first. So really my whole area of interest is around habitat and biodiversity creation because by making better habitats in our urban and semi-urban settings, and linking them together, these corridors. With our climate crisis, we, we create spaces for not only for ourselves and our own psychological and health benefits, but also for all the creatures who are going to be affected in, through our actions indirectly. And these spaces are so important for them to be able to migrate. Uh, you know, if you look at extreme cases around the world where we've got terrible forest fires happening, droughts happening. Um, we really need to create these corridors. And there is a very interesting uh, university in Pittsburgh, the, the Wiseman Institute. It's, um, it's connected to Ian McCarg, who was a very uh, 
interdisciplinary uh, landscape architect, architect and he set up this school in the university and they are now looking at mapping the world for the future and how important these connection points are from a micro scale to a macro scale. So that's what I'm interested in. Um, and that's the area I hope to work in for the benefit of living creatures, us included, we're part of this. Sounds like a very worthy uh, cause and a very uh, interesting thing to get involved in. So best of luck with that. Um, Thank you. No problem. Uh, Evan, if you wanted to maybe talk about, you know, what's your plan? You're in final year now. So what are you hoping to do next? Um, yeah, so this is nearly always a question that I get asked. Um, it was a concern of mine um, when I considered choosing the degree as well. Um, but I can assure you that like, there's definitely nothing to worry about. Um, there's a vast array of careers that can potentially come out of this degree. Um, personally, myself, I'm targeting the environmental, sorry, the environmental consultancy um, aspect of things, um, as environmental policy has always been a heavy interest of mine. Um, but there are both there are jobs um, everywhere associated with the degree um, as it's increasing in importance and there are jobs both in the private and public sector um, and UCD provides multiple opportunities for you to establish connections with potential future employers through you know internships or you know study abroad options and various different bits and bobs. Yeah great and I think the environmental consultancy side I think as you said is going to touch so many different um, industries um, every kind of industry is looking at to make themselves more sustainable, more environmentally conscious. So, yeah, I think it's a great area to be getting into um, and that you can do that with this particular degree, which is great. Um, and then, Ruth, obviously you're doing architecture. So are you planning to go into architectural practice or are you looking at other areas that you could potentially go into with an architecture degree? Um, yeah, I kind of split between um, going into more industrial architecture because obviously you can do different types of architecture once you finish. Um, so it's between that and then there's also I've actually been using the UCD mentorship program uh, so I've been talking to a lot of past students who've done architecture here and um, I was talking about possibly doing something like project management or planning which you can do after architecture do um, another master's in or um, some I know some past students have went into doing more like architectural journalism uh, there's one who has set up a company actually for fi finding internships for students who don't architecture and one of our tutors in particular um she is a photographer for architecture so you don't actually have to just become an architect or even just an architect who does one kind of thing you can go into industrial architecture you can go into residential architecture architecture yeah, great. So there is a lot of opportunities to do various aspects with your architecture degree. And that mentorship program sounds really great. And the fact that we do have a, a really large alumni network um, from our architecture program that you can lean on as well, which is which is great. Um, so the last question I'm going to officially pose to you before we see what our, our attendees are wanting to know is, do you have any advice for our, our attendees, advice for students who may be in second level looking to do one of our courses within the School of Architecture Plan and Environmental Policy or something that you wish you'd known before you came into the course? Uh, Lorraine, I might start with you. I suppose as we're talking about career paths for people, um, the career guidance office, D is a very good place to stay in touch with. And you might think I'm saying this, you know, to first years, possible first years, but really they say, come and talk to us from the beginning and we can, you know, advise and guide you as you're going through your studies and your ideas on where you might like to go with your, your career uh, is happening for you as you find out more and you build your knowledge base. So yes, I think they're an invaluable, um, addition in the university. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. I think it is a great resource for, for students, regardless of what um, course you're doing. I think it's great to just get uh, your foot in the door and as soon as you kind of get into the course, start figuring out maybe what direction you want to take. It's never too early. So yeah, that's really great advice. Um, Evan, if you have any advice for our attendees. Um, yeah, to follow up on Lorraine's point, um, definitely utilize the you know, facilities that are available to you, use the Math Support Centre, use the Writing Support Centre, use the IT Centre, 
um, definitely avail of those resources as they're like really, really helpful to get you settled in. Um, and then secondly, join as many sports and or sorry, sports clubs and societies as possible um, because they really do help you make friends, make great connections. Um, and they always host loads of events and, you know, training sessions and all that. And it's a really great way to get involved in the UCD community. Um, I found that it definitely helped me settle in really well. Yeah, and UCD does have a lot of clubs and societies on offer. There's probably something for everyone there. And yeah, as you said, it's a great way to get to know other people outside your course and just to be able to do, you know, something that's not classroom based and, and, and kind of explore new opportunities that way, which is great. Uh, Ruth, do you have anything you'd like to, to share as far as advice for our attendees? Um, I'd say not to worry about uh, the subjects you're doing now in secondary school um, and like whether they'll affect how well you do in your course or not because after the first year they'll show you so many different ways of doing things and it's all about just getting your ideas down on paper to show them and um, so I wouldn't be worried about that because you'll all be at the same level by the time second year starts and as I said it's just getting ideas down on paper so they can see and even if somebody else might be using a certain technique and doing a lot of it and it seems really good it's not if it's not your style don't worry about it. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I mean, you'll find you'll find your way, you'll find your style, you'll find your way of doing things um, and kind of what materials you like to use and how you like to do it. Um, and you'll learn that as you progress through the course itself, which is, I think that's good advice. Um, so I am going to open it up now. We've got a few questions coming in through our Q&A button. Um, for any of our attendees, continue to put them in there if we didn't um, answer anything as part of our panel discussion. Um, so I'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, let's see, the, uh, Ruth, I might go to you first. There was just someone asking, um, they're interested in interior architecture. Um, does interior architecture come into our architecture course here in UCD or is it, do you think it's a good foundation for somebody who's interested in that particular area? Uh, yeah, the course definitely involves uh, interior architecture. Like you look at uh, every project as a whole. Um, and also I know there is a few people in my course who uh, are thinking of going to into interior design um, and I think after you finish your three years you can go into that um, so yeah, yeah it definitely does include it yeah great so I, yeah maybe architecture is a good foundation and as you said you can do the three-year program and maybe finish after that and go into do a master somewhere else in, in potentially interior um, design or architecture and um, so it's good for them to know um, and then also Ruth just sticking with you there was something asking um, the major differences between maybe a degree in architecture here they were specifically asked about Italy or the Netherlands but maybe if, if you wanted to touch on do you think there's much of a difference between an architecture degree here or someone another country? Um, from what I've heard from students uh, from other countries studying here is that the staff are a lot more kind of friendlier and easy going here like it's a more kind of personal level and um, the hours also aren't as long as other countries maybe um, like uh, well I've heard uh, about Vienna and that the hours are very long there Um, I know UL they have I think their studios open 24 hours as well Um, so it's a good thing I guess that the studio closes here at nine and in all fairness the staff are very friendly and they'll help you out any way possible. Brilliant yeah and I think that the best advice for someone if they're looking at other places is is to attend events like this see if you can go on campus visits and um, speak to students and staff and just see where you get a, a good feel or a good vibe for and um, but as Ruth says our staff within um, architecture are really um, focused on the students and willing to help and support the students as they progress through the degree and um, which I think is a great um, is great for our students um, Evan I might ask you this one um, obviously you mentioned that obviously the facilities that um, you know Newstead and Richfed, Rich you have and the fact that it's slightly away from campus is a good thing but is there anything bad about it I mean someone was wanting to know is it annoying having the building slightly off the main campus campus um at times it can definitely be a little inconvenient um but i quite like the way that it is um because the Riffview campus is as own mentioned it's like a campus in itself so it's really small and you kind of get to know a lot of faces around it um and it definitely eliminates the whole kind of big aspect of the campus um yeah, I suppose that's that's really it. Um, I kind of like the way it is because you almost have two separate campuses to enjoy um, within the one. Yeah, I think that's good to know. And also just to mention that for, for students who maybe aren't coming into us right away, they're going to be coming into us in a, a number of years time. And um, we are having 
a new building may, uh, done up on campus as part of the, the UCD uh, Future Campus uh, project. Um, and that will be a unique building that is available for our students within the programs of the School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy. Um, so I might ask Katie if, if she can pop up a link to more information on our future campus so students can get a sense of maybe the buildings that will be there in the future for, for students of these programs. Um, but it won't be completed in the next couple of years. It might take a little bit longer than that. Um, and then, uh, Ruth, I'll go back to you just around someone's asking about assessment structure for architecture. So do you have exams or is it mainly continuous assessment? How are you actually graded in your architecture course? Um, so for studio, which is the 15 credit module, that uh, is continuous assessment and so is technology. Um, well, it's a mix of continuous assessment and um, in first year we had an exam, but due to COVID, a lot of it is online. Um, but the majority of it is continuous assessment for studio anyways, and then your other three modules will be uh, exams or assignments, mainly assignments more than exams. Yeah, and I think that's true for for um, for landscape architecture as well, would it be, Irene? It is, yeah. Um, basically, the 15 credits go towards studio. And very similar to architecture, you're given your brief every week and then you produce your work and you put it up and talk about it. And uh, yeah. And then the other modules, I think more for landscape architecture, we would be heading on our bicycles or jogging across campus to Newman, maybe, or to Life Sciences or to um, the science buildings or Ag Science for, for other modules that we do. So you get to see around the campus, but bikes are great. You can get across campus in five minutes. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, Ruth, and then obviously just back to you, um, architecture is a very popular one this evening. Um, is doing a master's of architecture um, a really important aspect? Do you need to do the master's or how does that work? Um, no, but you need to have five years of studio experience. So if you're gonna continue uh, with UCD, uh, you do, yeah. Um, so a lot of students do the masters anyways because you know it's the it's you know sorry I'm getting mixed up with myself. Uh, it's the highest you can get from the five years, so you might as well like a I know in other courses in the country you do five years and you only get a bachelor's. Um. So yeah, you yeah. So it's a natural progression. Yeah. The structure of the architecture course in UCD is is the bachelor leads directly onto the master's, you get your five years of experience, and then you can go work in practice for two years before you can sit your um your diploma, your diploma and your your exams and then and then become a registered architect. That's kind of how it works. So um it is important that you do the full kind of five years if you're wanting to practice as an architect. Now it doesn't have to be the full five years in UCD. You can do a bachelor in UCD and then a master's somewhere else and vice versa. Um, but it is important to get the five years of um as Ruth said, studio experience. Um, I think we mentioned a little bit earlier, but Ruth, you don't have to be good at maths to do architecture. I think that's something that someone was asking. Uh, no, definitely. And there's supports in UCD anyways uh, to help you. Like you might have one module for the year that will uh, uh, will, you'll need to do a bit of maths in, but uh, you can always go to the supports and a lot of the work you're doing is group work as well. And um, so you can rely on other people as well. Okay, great. And then um, Ruth, just sticking with you again, just um, in first year, what was some of the projects that you would have done in first year and, and did you find them difficult or? Um... In first year, you get a, uh, for student anyways, you get a good mix of stuff. Like every two weeks you get a new project. While for the rest of your time in UCD, you'll have one project for the whole semester. Um, so this could range from like, we had to build a table in first year. Um, I We just had, they kind of set you simple ideas as well, like create an experience from a memory you have, um, uh, just trying to create experience in a room. So if you walked in kind of to set the ideas of what they're looking for. Um, and then second semester and first year, you'll start into your first semester long project, which for me was the BOG project. Okay, brilliant. Um, and then Lorraine, just a question for you for landscape architecture. Is art history a major part of landscape architecture? Is that an option? Is that one of the subjects that you would have done? No, uh, no uh, yes, we did look at the development of art and architecture and landscape architecture. Um, we did study it because you need to look at what's gone before. You know, if you take somewhere like Central Park and the effect that had on, on a city like New York in the slum areas and 
you know, so you do, yes, you look at all those things, but you don't need to be worried about, it. you don't need to have done history of art before you come in a bit like the art. You learn as you go along and the lectures are interesting. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really good. Um, and then Lorraine, just one question for you it was about progression routes um, into landscape architecture. Um, obviously you came in through the mature entry itself. Um, mm -hmm. and to maybe just talk a little bit more about that. So I had I had a background in garden design, and um, I actually went to BFEI to do a course there, and then with that portfolio I applied to UCD and had an interview with Karen Foley and came in that route. Um, and so there are lots of options for people. I mean, people come through the Access Centre as well as mature students. The Access Centre run lots of adult education programmes where you can maybe take one or two modules and build on your modules. Um, so there, there are many routes and I would advise anybody who's interested to look at the website and then maybe to talk to Michael Hurick in the School of Landscape Architecture for advice. Okay, great. That's brilliant. Um, just we have time for maybe one or two more questions um, because we're kind of running slightly over time now. But um, Evan, there was one for you. Um, obviously, if you're doing the city planning course, um, can you become an urban planner? Is that one of the kind of careers that, that you can pursue? Um, yeah, it's definitely one of the careers that you can pursue. Um, from an undergraduate perspective, you'd have to complete the three-year um, course. Um, and then in order to become, become an urban planner, um, that would be consistent with doing a master's in regional and urban planning. Or perhaps you could look elsewhere and just do a master's in just purely urban planning. Um, that's as far as my knowledge goes on that. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Um, as I said, it's a you can kind of go a lot of different directions with the city planning course. It, it's it's got a lot of transferable skills. Um, Ruth, there's just one or two more questions on architecture that we might get through before we finish up. Um, obviously you talked about studio time, it's intensive, but did you do any clubs and societies with your workload? Were you able to fit that that in? Yeah, definitely. You can definitely fit in. Uh, like I said, after the first semester is the hardest, um, but after that you'll be fine. Uh, like I work as a residential assistant and a student ambassador, and I'm also part of the Architecture Society. And uh, once you're kind of organised with your time, it's actually grand. Okay. Yeah, I think that'll be a comfort to, to our attendees tuning in that it, it's not all work and no play. And um, then Ruth, just one or two more questions for you. Um, obviously for the year abroad or the, the optional year out that, that our students choose to do, um, because it's a, it's a year out, students can, can, as you said, do a variety of different things with them. Do you know of any students who've gone abroad or worked abroad um, as part of that particular year out? Um, yeah, I think uh, I've heard a few students, especially traveling around Europe for that year abroad. Um, because uh, they're hoping to do kind of a master's around Europe. Um, and then some students go to Australia, I think for the year and America and work in construction or even stay in Ireland or go to London. That's kind of what I've heard. Yeah, great. And then also there was just a question there um, around does the degree, you know, from UC, you know, to work outside of Ireland. So obviously because the degree is triple accredited from the U UK body, the Irish body and also the US body. And um, yes, the degree does travel quite well when you're looking for positions um, in other countries, obviously pending any, you know, state uh, board exams in the US or any um, specific country requirements that you have. But the degree is recognized in all those other countries. So you can work in other countries with our architecture um, degree. Um, and then obviously uh, there was just one other around um, has COVID affected the way lessons have been have been taught? I think they were asking specifically around architecture, Ruth, if you wanted to comment on that. Um, no, not really. Uh, the studio time now, the, stu uh, the tutors sometimes uh, do it over Zoom and for some modules uh, in staff uh, exam. Now, this would be like one module for the last maybe year or two. Um, they would change to an assignment, um, which is probably better than an exam. Um, so yeah, it hasn't really, and if it has, it's kind of changed for the better than the worse. Okay, brilliant. So uh, thank you very much to our students and our attendees for joining us. I think we got through pretty much most of the questions that we had. So um, thank you all for, for putting in the questions, for tuning in, for paying attention, for um, you know getting involved with the discussion. Um, so we're going to finish up our event there. I did want to just say that we are 
We have recorded the session this evening, so I am going to put the recording up on our YouTube channel, which is just UC Eng Arc, and I think Katie put a link to it in the chat earlier on this evening. It will be up there early next week, so if you missed anything or you, you arrived late, you can catch it there, or you can share it with your, you know, your your friends and and people in your school or or with your students if you're a guidance counselor, things like that. So it will be up there early next week. Uh, thank you to our students for um, a really great discussion, really great insights. Um, I think our attendees would have found it really really useful. Um, and hopefully we have attendees now who are definitely going to be doing one of one of the courses that we have on offer. Um, thank you to Katie for popping up um, all the information in the, the chat. Um, that was great. Um, and then just to finish up, if we didn't get to any questions or if you have questions that come up to you later on tomorrow, later on, or you know, a couple of months down the line, um, Katie did pop up my email address and her email address in the chat there. So please don't be afraid to reach out to us with any questions that you have. We're more than happy to help you out. Um, if needed, we're also more than happy to set up a one-to-one -one call, one-to-one -one phone call or Zoom call with you if that's needed as well. Um, and then I just that's all that's left for this evening. And to thank you for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Bye, everyone.